girl rescued me. <laughs> Eric, I think you swallowed a bit too much seawater. Ariel may want to be where the people are, but for three decades, she's been making humans fantasize about becoming mermaids. It's a mermaid! I've always believed in them! What is it about the mermaid that so captures our imagination? When you say mermaid, do you mean I take it as sort of fish? Only half. The other half, I understand, is quite human. If we look at our culture's vast collection of mermaid movies, literature, and art, we can see a number of repeating elements in the mermaid character. She had the most beautiful voice. A beautiful singing voice, a mirror and a comb for brushing her lovely long hair, best known for sitting on rocks, staring into mirrors, and obsessively combing our long, beautiful hair, a weakness for human men. He's very handsome, isn't he? and a powerful influence over them, too. That voice, I can't get it out of my head. Madison! Often the mermaid is an adventurous spirit who's self-educated. Where'd you get all these? I picked them up mostly from ships. Huh. So you can read? Of course. I didn't know English. Oh, I see, and now you do? Yes, I learned this afternoon from television. It's wonderful. Now I can ask you questions, and if you answer them correctly, you can win one of these valuable prizes. Meanwhile, her dark sister version, the Siren or Sea Witch, may complicate the good-hearted mermaid's plans. 30 years after The Little Mermaid hit the big screen, here's our take on the history of the mermaid in cinema and what the princess under the sea really represents. Won't you believe in me? If you do, there will always be mermaids. Before we go on, we want to talk about this video's sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can learn everything from video editing to business strategy, coding, or lucid dreaming. They offer thousands of online classes from famous teachers at the top of their field. And right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. So click the link in the description below to sign up now. First, a brief primer of the mermaid in cinema. In 1904, early special effects master George Méliès made a short film about a mermaid, and already it visualized the figure's transformation into a human woman. Starting in 1911, Australian professional swimmer Annette Kellerman starred in a number of mermaid films including the first ever mermaid feature film, Neptune's Daughter in 1914. And you can see her legacy in the elaborate synchronized swimming sequences that later became popular in Hollywood. In the post-World War II period, mermaids, according to Beatrice Philpotts, were an escapist expression of post-war optimism. As a lady of the wide open sea, the mermaid is connected to a feeling of freedom and liberation. And we can see this in the 1948 British mermaid comedy, Miranda. Maybe a bit lightheaded, but to me you seem to have a, a tail. Yeah. I have. I'm a mermaid. Glynis John's beguiling Miranda may be intent on catching more than her share of men and putting them under her spell. Men are fickle creatures. Oh, I love them. But she's hardly looking to be tied down by what these guys and their wives or fiancés assume she's after. Marriage. Well, I think they both wanted to marry you. Both of them. <laughs> Isn't it absurd? The upbeat ending of the film is her escape and her avoiding a future on Earth as some kind of fish in a bowl. Later mermaid stories continue the fear that this beautiful creature might be trapped and confined to a fish bowl, and they lament what a crime it would be to sentence this wild soul to captivity. The same year saw Mr. Peabody and the mermaid. My husband's in love. Of course. With a mermaid. And Miranda was followed up by the sequel, Mad About Men in 1954. I dare say he's very dependable. Dependable my tail. These mermaid movies had a certain permissive playfulness. Oh, so you've got a wife? Yes. Well, there are plenty of men on land. She'll soon find another one. The mermaid as a symbol of liberation continues in later versions of this character as a free spirit and rebel who doesn't care for conventionality. 
Mrs. Flax doesn't believe in ritual or tradition. The 80s gave us the two most iconic mermaids in modern memory, Daryl Hannah's Madison in Splash, and of course, Ariel, voiced by Jodie Benson in The Little Mermaid. Based on the 1837 story by Hans Christian Andersen, Ariel's looks were based on Alyssa Milano, and her red hair was a conscious attempt to distinguish her from Hannah, as Splash was also released by Disney under its adult-facing label, Touchstone Films. In broad strokes, these two films both tell the story of a pure love that has to overcome obstacles. All my life, I've been waiting for someone, and when I find her, she's... she's a fish. Since these two films, countless mermaid movies have catered to an explosion of fascination with the figure. Bonya loves those games! I will be a human too! Going back to long before she hit the big screen, let's look at the mermaid's roots in mythology and literature. We are not fictional. We're discreet. Her earliest version appears to be a Targetus, an ancient Syrian fertility goddess who was sometimes represented with a fishtail. This spirit continued in the Greek goddess Aphrodite and her Roman counterpart Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. How are you going to paint me? Ah, like, um like Venus rising out of the sea. Aphrodite may not have a fish tail, but she was born of sea foam, and Ovid's Metamorphosis mentions Venus transforming into a fish to disguise herself. To this day, the mermaid continues to be, at her core, a Venus-like embodiment of beauty and love. She's not only stunning herself, but she also sees beauty everywhere she looks. Have you ever seen anything so wonderful in your entire life? Wow. Music, I like it. I heard some in the television. She's moved by small wonders in the world around her. There's something about your face that makes me want to cry. And teaches humans to reopen their eyes to all the beauty they've become blind to. Pretty! Well, uh, yeah. I've never really thought about it before. In her less innocent iterations, the mermaid is well aware of her charms and the mermaid's mirror is traditionally a symbol of her vanity. The mermaid's story is typically all about love. It's the closest thing we have to magic. As we can see in The Little Mermaid and Splash. He's got to kiss you. Not just any kiss. The kiss of true love. The figure feels and inspires love at first sight. Come back! Oh, why didn't I learn how to swim? Giving herself instantly and totally. Hi. She's driven by a pure, shameless sexuality, and she doesn't have any of a typical woman's inhibitions. She also bravely expresses her emotions without self-consciousness. Madison, where's your necklace? I traded it for the statue. Why? Because I love you. She's a deeply instinctive being. You don't know me very well. Oh, yes, I do. Well, how could you after such a short time? Knowing some people is a matter of instinct. At first, in Splash and the Little Mermaid, falling in love seems easy and simple. The couples enjoy an immediate connection and rapport, even before they can talk to each other. Sooner or later, though, love presents a test. You said whatever my secret was, you'd understand. <laughs> that at least I was a human being. In Splash, the conclusion of Tom Hanks' Alan giving up his human life to live with the mermaids is a fun twist on the usual assumption that it must be the mermaid who sacrifices her underwater existence for love. In the end, love demands that both parties be willing to sacrifice everything to be together. If I become human, I'll never be with my father or sisters again. But you'll have your man. <laughs> Life's full of tough choices, isn't it? We can see the mermaid's nature as a fertility goddess in the character of Miranda. The movie ends with her giving birth to a baby, presumably fathered by the doctor she caught and seduced. I wonder why she said she wanted to be somewhere lovely in May. I wonder. So the suggestion is that her goal was really to procreate while having a little fun and then go back to her world. 
Well, aren't there any men under the sea who you could give them to? Oh, yes, a few. But they have little eyes and flat noses, most unattractive. That's why we're practically extinct. And after the turbulence of the men's lust for Miranda, the couples reaffirm their commitments to each other and end far more passionately in love than before. So it's as if they've been visited by some mischievous, otherworldly force to reawaken their fertility impulse. Likewise, after Mr. Peabody's embarrassing affair with the sea maiden, in the end, when he gives the mermaid Lenore's comb to his wife and they decide to stay in for the night, symbolically, it's as if their marital lust has been restored. There's no denying that to a large degree, the mermaid is a sexual fantasy. I was being drawn to this fantastic creature by something more than just a scientific interest. And many of her symbols, like shells and the comb she's often pictured with, have sexual connotations. The ancient Greek and Latin words for comb carry double meanings related to the pubic area. The mermaid is a symbol of unattainable sexuality. But don't you find your tail rather a handicap with the gentleman? Oh no, it provides what you might call an element of surprise. Frequently, her narrative purpose is to represent or draw out sexual urges that the characters, generally men, have to confront. There's a recurring trope of the mermaid's love saving the man. In Miranda, the men's desire for the mermaid is their bachelor impulses putting up one last fight before they're ready to settle down for good. I don't think I shall want to go fishing next year. No more bachelor holidays? Never again. In Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid, the mermaid is there purely to help solve the man's midlife crisis. You don't think that 50 is so conclusive, do you? No, of course not. Why should you? What's so dreadful, really, about a few gray hairs? She doesn't actually speak a word of dialogue, while Mr. Peabody monologues incessantly at her, narrating her feelings, teaching her to kiss. That's what we call a kiss. Naming her. Lenore and interpreting her personality entirely around his desires. You do love me, don't you? <gasps> oh, what's that? Teenagers, <laughs> they think they know everything. You give them an inch, they swim all over you. As Ariel's story makes clear, on one level the mermaid myth symbolizes coming of age, especially the coming of age of a young woman. I'm 16 years old. I'm not a child Don't anymore. you take that tone of voice with me, young lady! At its core, The Little Mermaid is a story of a girl's metamorphosis into an adult. This hybrid of human and fish is an apt metaphor for the adolescent who's half in one state, childhood, and half in the other, adulthood. Ariel is eager to become fully human, or to grow up, but her dad wants her to stay a fish. In other words, he doesn't want his little girl to grow up too fast. As long as you live under my ocean, you'll obey my rule. The mermaid story is a perfect parable of puberty because it gets at the physicality of that phase's transition. The change from fins to legs mirrors a young woman's maturing sexuality, and it's no accident that getting legs usually coincides with her falling in love. Meanwhile, losing her tail can feel like a loss, just as it can be sad to leave behind childhood. And the changes can be very messy and painful. Mermaid characters can be a little boy crazy. He's beautiful. He's so beautiful. Echoing the adolescent's excitement over first crushes. Why, Eric, run away with you? <laughs> this is all so, so sudden. Ariel captures the teen's eager enthusiasm for what's to come, and as a character she's so compelling because of her positive curiosity, courage, and sense of adventure. Isn't it fantastic? At the same time, she reflects the conflict and struggle of the adolescent period. Daddy, I love him! 1990s Mermaids, which features only metaphorical mermaids, also uses the figure to embody a state of transition. Director Richard Benjamin said that Winona Ryder's teen Charlotte is half girl, half woman. You know, Charlotte, I think you might be old enough for a boyfriend now. If I'm old enough, maybe you're too old. Don't be ridiculous. A real woman is never too old. The mermaid figure is a mix of child and woman. The beauty of eternal wisdom. And it's the beauty of a child, too. Despite her womanly charms, she has a childlike sense of wonder and openness. She's been here for 
six hours. Excuse me, miss. I'm going to have to insist that, uh, that uh, you stop doing that. Her youthful and new way of looking at things rejuvenates those she encounters who may have become too worldly and realistic, too adult about it all. In a broader way, the mermaid as a symbol of flux is relatable to people who are going through transitions of any kind. Some have seen Ariel's story as an illustration of gender dysphoria, while others relate to the mermaid's feeling of being an outsider. Because I feel the seawater in my veins. Because I listen to the roar of the sea and it speaks to me like a mother's voice. Between two worlds, not fully belonging to either. I'm just a fish out of water. The mermaid story also dramatizes the feeling of cultural differences. My name is... And what it's like to be a foreigner or alien in a place very unlike where you come from. Where I come from, it never gets cold. They don't have ice, and they don't have music, and they don't have clothes. Just what kind of a place is this? Comedy derives from the fish out of water trying to learn our customs, while sometimes failing to hide her natural habits. and bringing little pieces of home with her. Are you allowed to drink, Miranda? A glass of salt water, please. A what? A glass of salt water. There are two broad categories or types of mermaids. The light version, the love-struck maiden who dreams of coming on land, falls for a human man, and or wants a soul. And the dark one, the evil femme fatale mermaid, an animalistic, man-eating siren. Mermaids, seagulls, devilfish, dreadful in hunger of a flesh of man. In Little Mermaid, we can see a version of both the light and the dark sea woman. Ariel is the good-hearted, love-driven type, while Ursula is the evil enchantress. So long, love boy. More animal than human, and therefore a perceived enemy to our kind. Well, it's time Ursula took matters into her own tentacles. We can see prototypes for the Dark Mermaid in Greek mythology's sirens, who used their beautiful songs to lure sailors to their deaths. In siren-descended stories, the Dark Mermaid pairs her beauty with a false illusion of human feelings, underneath which lurks heartless animal hunger. Them sirens did this to Pete. They loved him up and turned him into a horny toad. This dual form is, of course, exactly what Ursula uses to bewitch Eric. 2015 Polish horror musical The Lure also features the dark mermaid who likes to eat men and the light mermaid who loves one. But that movie highlights that while the dark mermaid is an unapologetic man-eater, the light mermaid ends up, like in Hans Christian Andersen's story, losing herself for a man who doesn't love her back. Dennis Hopper's 1961 mermaid thriller Night Tide I guess I love the sea most of all, but I'm afraid of it too. plays on the mermaid's hunger to consume men, as we can see in the poster. The mermaid as femme fatale represents pure sexual energy. Now mermaids are not as they are in storybooks. They are dark creatures, in touch with all things mysterious. You might say that the light version of the mermaid represents sexual love, while the dark version represents sex without love. Unbridled sex is seen as a threat to civilized society, and its building block, marriage. Over time, the mermaid changed from a god or mythical creature into one that people really believed existed. I'm telling you, Grim, she was real. By the time of Pliny the Elder's writing in the first century AD, people reported sightings of mermaids all over, and these increased as maritime travel became central with the Age of Discovery around the 15th to 17th centuries. To make sense of her growing popularity, Christianity framed the mermaid siren as a symbol of vice and a temptation to men's souls. Undines, or underwater spirits, were seen as mentally just like people, but lacking a soul. Still, it was thought that a select few mermaids wanted to be saved, and a folklore developed that they could achieve an immortal soul by marrying a mortal man. 
In The Little Mermaid's Inspiration, the 1837 Hans Christian Andersen tale, the mermaid longs for a soul as much as she wants her beloved prince. When he chooses another and it appears all has been in vain, she dies. Disney went with a happier romantic ending, but Andersen's tale has a silver lining. The Little Mermaid becomes a daughter of the air with the opportunity to earn a soul through doing good deeds over the next approximately 300 years. Now at least, her destiny is in her control. As this is a story of transition, the peril and sadness of it comes from the fact that she can't stay forever on land. The mermaid can only soak her tail in a bathtub for so long. The mermaid was taking a bath. A bubble bath. She has limited time. How long are you going to be in town? Six fun-filled days. Oh, six days. Is that all? Three days. This period of change must give way to permanence of one kind or another. If I stay longer than that, I can't ever go back. All things, however lovely, must pass. And throughout her many iterations, this figure is infused with a tragic longing for what can never be. A beauty that's too good to be true. A love that can't last. Just as the dream of being a mermaid, or being with one, is for most of us only that, a dream. Then I guess there's just one problem left. How much I'm going to miss her. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community we love. With thousands of classes taught by seasoned pros, Skillshare has a class on pretty much anything you could want. You can develop your creativity through a class on calligraphy, graphic design, or writing. You can learn to succeed in business with classes on how to make it as a freelancer, market a podcast, or become an Instagram influencer. You can use it to master new technology through classes on web design, coding, and data science. Or you can bring that extra flair into your lifestyle, sharpen your knife skills, learn paper making, speak Spanish. Or let Lauren Cox, an interior designer and the design program manager for Havenly, teach you simple steps to transform your home no matter your budget. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. Just click the link in the description below to check it out today.